Today I want to talk a little bit about endothermic reactions, exothermic reactions, and how we can use stoichiometry, this idea of converting or changing one species in a chemical reaction to another, um, to figure out how much energy would be produced or how much energy is absorbed in a chemical process um, given different starting amounts or div given different ending amounts. So we're able to use the stoichiometric process, that dimensional analysis process, to also get at some quantities of energy so long as we have a balanced chemical equation and we're given the delta H. And the delta H is the enthalpy, the change in the heat of the reaction going from reactants to products. And an endothermic reaction is one in which energy is absorbed by a system. So I've defined the system. That system needs to absorb energy from the surroundings in order for the reaction to occur. That's called an endothermic or endergonic reaction. The term endergonic um, comes from more biochemical kind of application. So I tend towards the term endothermic because I like therm for thermal for heat, endo, heat is coming in, heat is being absorbed. The sign on my delta H then, I would be able to recognize that it's an endothermic reaction if I have a positive change going from reactants to products. And using this information and what we've done with dimensional analysis, we can solve problems that look like this. So how much energy do I have to absorb by these reactants, my nitrogen and my oxygen, in order to produce my nitrogen dioxide given this starting quantity of nitrogen. So I'm going to start this in the same way that I do with all of my stoichiometry problems. I need to identify my thing one and thing two. In this case, I'm given information about my nitrogen, so that would be my thing one, and it's asking for information about my energy, which is going to be my thing two. Now that's kind of a weird thing to think about, right, is that uh, we usually will do here's a reactant and here's information about it's asking for information about another reactant or about a product but now we're talking about the energy of the process how much is required and that's my thing too now when i have an endothermic reaction and i have a positive delta h so that's how i tell i can think about this heat as a reactant so we could also think about this as my thing too if we wanted to sort of visualize it that way in alignment with the balanced chemical process because I have to put heat in so heat is like a reactant it's like an extra thing that is required in order for this reaction to produce products so we start with our grams of thing one like we do in any stoichiometric process and we're going to go from grams of thing one to moles of thing one And so we go to the periodic table and we see that nitrogen is 14.1. We have two of them. It's going to give us 28.02 grams. And now here's kind of the new bit. Now I can go from moles of nitrogen, which I have one in this balanced chemical process. For every one mole of nitrogen that I'm reacting, I'm going to require 180.5 kilojoules of heat energy. So for every one mole, I have this relationship here. Again, this is a balanced chemical process. If I think of the heat in alignment, it's a one-to-one -one ratio of the heat to my nitrogen. And when I plug this in, and I'm looking at three sig figs here in my answer, I end up with 341 kilojoules that is required. Okay, so I have to require 341 kilojoules if I'm starting with 52.9 grams of nitrogen. Now, if we're picturing this visually, because this is kind of a hard thing to get your head around, this is very conceptual to think about energy, even though we can measure temperature changes and we can measure the energy, the heat that comes off of it, even just by touching a reaction container. But, um, but it's just kind of hard to get a tricky thing to get your head around. So I kind of like to think about it in terms of an energy diagram. So if I have on my y-axis here energy, it's increasing. And then along the bottom here, I have kind of my reaction progress or time. So as time goes on, we're kind of going from time zero to whatever time, however long it takes for this reaction to occur. And if I'm picturing this process, my reactants here have a lower energy. So here's my N2 and my O. 
my products have a higher energy. So here's my 2NO. And what we'll learn in later chapters is that we have to overcome an energy barrier. So we have to overcome some sort of energy in order to get from reactants to products. And this energy that's required to overcome this barrier is called the activation energy. I like to think about it like rolling a ball up a hill, right? We kind of have this hill here. If I don't put enough energy in to get that ball up the hill, then the ball is just going to come back down. But if I can get enough energy to get it to the top of this hill here, then it's going to roll down on its own. So you have to overcome this barrier in order to get from my reactants to my products. And so this is energy that has to come in. And then this kind of dip here on the downside is, is this is a good thing. This is an awesome thing. It's, it's good to produce products and you always get some amount of energy out when you do that. So there's kind of this balance then between energy that's required that needs to come into the system and you get a little bit of energy out no matter what. The balance between these two and the difference between the energies of my starting amounts and my ending amounts so looking at my reactants to my products here, this is my enthalpy. This is my change in energy of the reaction. And so we can see that this is going to be positive because this value is higher, greater, larger than this one. And so when I subtract the two, my final minus initial, that's going to give me a positive delta H. So kind of visually, I can see that this is going to be an endothermic process. And this is a way to map that out kind of along with, along with the numbers. All right, so that's endothermic. Let's look at an exothermic example. Now, exothermic reactions are the opposite. We have energy that's released from the system out into the surroundings, and this is also called an exergonic reaction, so kind of using that same term. Again, I like the therm part, the heat part. It looks like thermal. Exo meaning it's coming out of or from, like you're exiting from there. So that would give me a delta H that's negative or I, I would know that it's an exothermic reaction when I calculate that there's a negative delta H, or if I see a negative delta H, then I would be able to tell that. So let's solve a problem, and then we'll kind of do that energy diagram for this one as well. Let's look at this combustion reaction. Combustion reactions are known for producing energy. That's why they're um, that's why they're useful. That's why they're important. We burn a hydrocarbon. We react it with oxygen. It forms carbon dioxide and water. In this case, this is methane. So we're going to do the combustion of methane here. And we see that our delta H is negative 800 or N90 kilojoules. And so that many kilojoules of energy is released in this chemical process. So this is asking then, well, how much heat is produced if I have a certain mass of oxygen. And again, we can use dimensional analysis and our stoichiometry process. Now, because heat is released, we can think of heat as sort of an extra product. So again, if I added heat to my reactant side, that would mean that it's endothermic. If I'm adding heat to my product side, then that would mean that it's exothermic. So I can kind of think of it in line with the balanced chemical process. It's giving me information about oxygen, so that's my thing one. The heat is going to be my thing too, because that's what it's asking about. And so in the same way I do stoichiometry, I can go from grams of thing one to moles of thing one. Grams of thing one to moles of thing one. And then I can go from moles of thing one to thing two, or moles of thing two. In this case, it's just heat. So we're just going from the two moles of oxygen that I have to my energy. So this is that 890 kilojoules. So I go to the periodic table. I see that the molar mass of one oxygen is 16. So that gives me 32 here. So here's my dimensional analysis set up. My grams divide out, my moles divide out. I'm left with an answer in kilojoules. And when I solve that out, I get 1,335 kilojoules. And it looks like we're sticking with four sig figs from these guys, but we would round to probably two if we don't know how certain that, that zero is on our kilojoules. We have to actually look that one up. So if I was rounding this to two significant figures, if we're not certain, then this would be 1.3 times 10 to the 
times 10 to the third kilojoules. Now this is the amount of energy that is released, and I can tell that it's being released because of that negative sign, because recall that energy can never be negative. I can't have a negative amount of energy. That doesn't physically make any sense, but this sign convention shows that the energy is being released from this process, from the system, out into the surroundings. And again, if we're looking at an energy diagram then, so here's energy along my Y again. And here's my reaction progress or my time. Then in this case, I have pretty stable products or pretty stable reactants compared to my products. So I have, here's my methane. I think I just said that backwards. I think I was trying to say it the right way the first time. So I have higher energy reactants, lower energy products. Whatever I said, <laughs> that's what I meant. And lower energy for my carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide and water are really stable. They're very low energy. They're pretty chill, pretty mellow. Methane and oxygen, a little more reactive, so they're a little higher energy. They still have to overcome some sort of amount of energy here, so we'll just kind of make a little bump here. Here's my hill for thinking about that energy. We have to overcome a certain amount of energy. That's that activation energy here. So I have this kind of minimum amount of energy to get it up and over the hill when I'm when I'm reacting these things together. So I get some energy in. I get some energy out and kind of comparing these two. And again, visually, I, I like these energy diagrams because I'm kind of a visual learner. So I like seeing, oh, there's so much more energy out than I had to put in, right? So if I'm even just kind of measuring those two, then I can see that this is going to be exothermic because we have more energy out than I had to put in. But if I'm thinking about it in terms of enthalpy, the difference between my reactants and products, that's going to be this line here, right? The difference between reactants, products. Now my products are lower, so this is a smaller number. This is a larger number. That means that this is going to be a negative quantity. So that gives me an exothermic reaction. So my products are more stable and energy is released. And again, we can use stoichiometry so long as we have a balanced chemical process and we have this delta H, then we can do kind of practical calculations of how much energy can I get out if I have a certain starting amount? What if I start with a ton of oxygen? How much would I get out? And you can model different energetic processes that way too, right? If I'm producing this much carbon dioxide, how much is that going to heat things up? We could see that there would be some interesting applications with that. All right. If you have any questions on this, don't hesitate to reach out. Otherwise, I will talk to you again soon, and have a great day.